Chapter 8 of The Nightland by William Hope Hodgson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Nightland, Chapter 8 Down the Mighty Slope. Now I went downward very quiet and slow into that darkness, and did make but a cautious way. For now you shall know me truly wrapped about with such a night as did seem to press upon my very soul, and such as you shall never have seen nor felt, so that I did seem lost even from myself, and did appear as that I went presently in unreal fashion, and did pass onward for ever and for ever through everlasting night, so that odd whiles I did make to walk with random, as that I stepped no more upon this earth but did go offwards into the void. Yet was this foolishness of the mind set straight and proper each time that it did come about, for lo, I did kick against an upjutting rock here, and fall upon a great and unseen boulder there, and so was shaken very quickly to a sound knowledge that I trode the hard and actual earth, and had no true dealings with unreal matters. And ever I did go downward, and by this only did I have a guide to my way. Yet, as you shall think, through reason of utter dark I made scarce a mile in an hour or even two full hours, and so grew bitter by reason of mine unableness to go forward with a proper and free stride. But I did think me presently upon a thing that I should do to light my path, and to this end I did make the discos to spin odd whiles, and did look down the mighty slope, the little way that the strange glistening of the discos did show and so fixed my path into mine inward remembering, and would go forward afresh, until that I was shaken once more by the darkness, and would fain to look once again upon the blessedness of light, and make me some knowledge of my way. And truly the light from the discos did seem astonishing great, and this to be because there was so monstrous a darkness all about me there for ever and thereafter would I go onward again, until the pain of my stumblings did bid me surely to have that sweet shining once more into my path. And so shall you perceive my going, and sore and miserable was it unto the heart, and like to shake the courage of the spirit, yet in verity I had come through much, and did have intent to give way to no foolishness of thought and you shall well believe that I did make the light not more oft than I did surely need, for it was no properness of wisdom to use the power of the discos, save for mine extremity. Now presently, when I had done this wise through six long and bitter hours, and it being now beyond the twentieth hour since I did last slumber, I sat me down there upon the mighty slope, in the everlasting dark, and did eat two of the tablets, and made the water, and could but feel and hearken whether I did this thing right and that. And when I had eaten drunk I unfolded my cloak and wrapped it around me, and placed the scrip and the pouch under my head, and the discos I took to company me, and so fell swiftly upon sleep, yet did think earnestly but vaguely upon Nani as I came unto slumber. And I slept all but six hours, and did waken very sudden there in the utter dark, and I got me to mine elbow, and did listen very keen. For I had waked immediately, as that something had touched me, or come nigh unto me, and I gripped the discos and listened, but there did not even a little sound come to me out of all that night. And presently I had more assuredness that naught did make harm about me, and I sat me up in the dark, and reached for my scrip, and did eat and drink there in the utter night and fumbled somewhat, as you shall think. Yet I was done in a while, and got my gear upon me, and the discos into my hand, and so to my feet and forward. Now all that day I did have a strange unease of the spirit, so that I stopped off to listen, as that my soul told of something nigh unto me that did follow very quiet. Yet did mine ears perceive nothing and so I alway to go downward again into the night that held the slope. And here should I tell how that in the early part of the seventh hour, after I had eaten drunk, and went forward as ever, upon my journey down the mighty slope, I did have a very sore tumble against a sharp rock, 
for I put my foot sudden into a small hole, and this did make me to pitch. And I was utter shaked by the fall, and lay very quiet for a time, for the rock had surely ripped my body, but for the armor. And after that I was something renewed of strength and spirit, I made that I should go no more upon my feet, but upon my hands and knees, and thus should I feel the way that I went, and have a less need of the discos, which had not overmuch use to light my way, in that I shone it not often, and did guess more than I did perceive, as you may think. And so I crept all that day, which was a bitter way of travel. Yet had I done many a sore mile thus through the nightland. And when that I had gone downward for eighteen hours, and eat and drunk thrice, I ceased from my labor, and did feel about in the darkness, that I come to a level place for my rest, and so did find presently a place not so bad, and did push and cast away such small boulders as have been like to irk me. Then did I eat and drink, and afterward composed me to my sleep, and had many a thought of Nani, as I did drift unto slumber. Yet also had I memories of the strange half-fear that had been with me all that day, as though something went constantly near me in the dark. And because of this, twice did I rise unto mine elbow and listen, but heard no sound to trouble me, and afterward did trust that I did but fancy, and so came at last unto slumber, that yet was not over-restful, for truly I did listen even as I slept. And when I had been asleep scarce six hours, I waked again very sudden, as I had done before, and had belief that something did be a nigh unto me, and I gripped the discos and did hearken, yet was there no sound that mine ears did wot of, neither aught that had power to be surely known of the spirit. And all that day was as the day before, save that about the eighth hour I came near to fall into some monstrous pit in the great slope, but did only fall with my breast upon the edge, and so drew back, and presently did crawl all around it in the dark, and come safe unto the lower side, yet shaken, and put more in trouble of spirit than before, and fearful how I should go, for I knew not whether I had come among such things, or whether I had but few to sorrow me. And so you shall perceive that I went over-cautious for a great while in all that utter dark but did think at last upon a plan to go with more surety and speed. But to this I did need a cord, and surely I had no cord upon me. And if a boy be no boy that hath none such about him, shall not the same be said of any man. And this I did think as I searched me, for the sayings of that day had many that were like to this. Yet in the end I did compass my plan for I did buckle the scrip and the pouch together, and took one of the straps from the pouch, and this strap was long and thin, and well suited unto my purpose. Then I fixed a stone into the end of the strap, and buckled it there, and after that I cast the stone before me, as I went upon my hands and knees. And I did hold to the hither end of the strap, and so was able to have something of knowledge whether there lay any great deepness immediately before me and this wise to strive that I fall not down some monstrous cliff in the night. And so did I go, casting the stone continually to my front, down the slope. And this you shall think to be a cumbersome fashion of travel, yet was I in better case than in all the time since I had begun to go downward of the mighty slope in the everlasting darkness. And at the eighteenth hour I did sleep, and was waked strangely before the sixth hour, even as I had waked before. And this did put always upon me a new wonder and unease. Yet did no harm seem to come unto me, and I did strive that I have no needful trouble of mind. But that something was always nigh unto me in the dark I do truly believe, yet have I no knowing that it was evil, for it harmed not me. And three days more I journeyed thus, and did never cease to creep downward, weariful upon my hands and knees, and the discos I had to my hip, and so shall you know how I carried it. And by this, as you do know, I had been on the great slope six days of utter dark, 
and did have no wadding but that I went into some dire and dreadful place, for surely I had gone forever downward a monstrous way. And here, before I tell further, I must set down how that the cold was much gone from out of the air upon the slope, and the air was grown, as it did seem, very heavy unto my chest. And concerning this matter I should say something for if I do mind me I have said not overmuch concerning the air of the nightland and the mighty pyramid, for truly I have been so set to tell my story of all that I did truly see and adventure upon. Yet though I have said but little, you will surely have perceived that the air of that far and chill time was not as the air of this, but was thin and keen within the nightland, and lay not, as I do think, to a great height above the land but only nigh to the earth. And as you do know through my tellings, there was a wondrous difference between the air within the mighty pyramid and that which lay without around the base, for upward beyond that I did understand that there was no outward air that any should breathe, and so was all the pyramid sealed in certain wise in all the upper cities for ever, and whether it was sealed utterly from the outward air at the base I do not surely remember if in truth that I did ever bother my head to such matters. Yet if I be set proper in memory and understanding, we did draw air from the underground fields, but whether they gad any change or newness of air from the nightland I have no knowledge, and do lament that I have no sure knowing. Yet, as you shall believe, I could surely write an hundred books upon that wonder of the future, and be still lacking in the half of all that there is to be told, and so do I try to have courage to this my task, and to have no over-trouble, because that I do tell but a little of a great tale. And here in this place will I set down how that the peoples of the pyramid were greater to the chest, methinks, than we of this age. But yet do I have no over-surety in the matter for well it may be that the reason of this age doth blind within me somewhat the knowledge that I have concerning that, for in verity is it not but a natural thing to believe those peoples to be greater of the chest, so that they should make a proper dealing with the thin air of that place and that time. And yet, as I do strive to make plain unto you, because this thing should be, by the making of my reason, I do the more distrust that reason shall make foolish my knowledge, for even a fool should suppose that which I have told, and the truth may be even otherwise. Yet that the peoples of the upper cities had great chests I do well know, for this was a common knowledge, even as we of this age do acknowledge the peoples of Africa to be of blackness, or those of Patagonia to be of great stature. And by this one thing should any know a man of the upper cities from a man of the lower cities. And because that there grew this difference among the peoples, there had been once, as any could learn from the histories, a plan whereby the peoples should be moved upward and downward through the great height of the mighty pyramid, from this city unto that. Yet had it met with great disfavor, and was put out of force and this is easy to be seen as the natural way of the human heart. And here it doth occur unto me that it was like enough to be a plan for health, beside of training of the mind, that each youth and maid was put to travel through all the cities of the mighty pyramid, the which did take three years and two hundred and twenty-five days, as I have told before this. For by this plan were they made to breathe the air of every height, and this mayhaps unto the good of their developing, and they also to discover that air which was best to their need. And concerning the air of the nightland you shall know that there was in all that land no flying thing, because that the air was grown very thin. Yet, as the records did show, there had once been monstrous flying brutes that went over the land in mighty bounds. But this was in a long-gone age, and we could but suppose that the records gave truth. And here you shall know that, when the Monstruakens did learn that I would journey through the nightland in search of Nani, there had been some foolish and well-intended talk among them that I take a small flying ship, 
that was in the great museum beside the models of the great ships. For truly this machine was yet sound to go, for it was made of the grey metal of the mighty pyramid that did seem to have no power to cease. Yet, in verity, I had no skill to manage this, neither had it flown through an hundred thousand years, so that none did know the mastership of that art, which did be learned but by a constant practice, and oft made uneasy by fallings that did wreck the machine, as I did know from the book of flying. And, moreover, as I have told, the air of the nightland was grown over weak to uphold such a thing which, I doubt not, had made the peoples of the pyramid to cease from flyings, quite so much as that they did fear the forces of evil in the night. And if that there had been air and skill sufficient unto this purpose of flying, yet had I been wicked with foolishness that I should work to be hung upward in the night, for all the evil of the nightland to behold. And though I had gone up some great way, yet the machine had surely made a great noise in the quietness of the eternal night, as you shall suppose. Now, indeed, am I gone weary that I should need to tell so much concerning the air of that time and place, for surely I do seem to make this my story as that I did make a lecturing upon matters of chemistry, and so do I cast about, that I may not bother to tell more upon this matter. Yet in truth, a little more of my thinkings and observings had I better set down here, and so be done with it. But you shall have patience with me, and know that, had this, my story, been no more than an idle tale, I had been free to make no labour with such matters. Now there doth a wonder come to me, why that the road-makers, who were of that far-off age which was before the age of the mighty pyramid, did not fly downward from the upper world into the deep of the monstrous valley, but did instead build a road. Yet it may be that the air of the upper world had grown thin a great age, so that they had truly forgot that once man did have the power to fly. But even if that they did have proper machines to this purpose, surely it were a wondrous and fearful thing to fly downward an hundred great miles for they surely to have a dread that they never to rise again through so huge a deep. And moreover, the downward world that was the bottom of the great valley was full of monsters, as was told in the little metal book. And the monsters were very strange and unknown, and foreign to the whole world that had never come unto the deep of the valley. And the valley had come, as you shall mind, when the earth did split, and this thing was, in truth, like to be thought that the same ending of the world which all nations have been taught to believe shall come. For, in verity, when the world did split and burst, and the oceans rushed downward into the earth, and there was fire and storms and a mighty chaos, surely it was proper to think that the end had come. Yet was it, in truth, but the beginning of hope of a new eternity of life so that out of the end came the beginning, and life out of death, and good out of that which did seem a dire matter. And so is it always. Yet doth this go past my first wonder, which did concern the wherefore that they had made not to descend in the things of flight. Yet maybe shall my reason stand to show why this was not. And again, mayhap it did chance that some were wild adventurers, and did leap over the edge of the upper world, having to ease their flight certain contrivings, like to parachutes. And these you shall picture, as that you watch them to leap, and so shall you see them go downward into the gloom, and you shall see them for maybe ten miles, and maybe for twenty miles, and afterward shall they be lost utterly in that great deep, and see no more of any man for ever. But when the nations became road-makers, and came downward slowly to the monstrous deep of the mighty valley that did split the world, then were they come there by millions, and with power sufficient to fight against the beasts, and afterward to grow back again to an ancient civilizing, and so to the building of the great airships that were yet shown in the great museum of the pyramid. And here shall I cease from these thinkings on this matter, for indeed, 
who shall say what did be truly a reason for those peoples and what was their need, and so do I come to no surety by my wonderings. Yet, as you do know, all things do seem verily to go in a circle. For, behold, in time they of the mighty pyramid were likewise held off from the glory of the airships, and so were gone backward a great way, according as we do look upon this matter. And so hath this been the way always, and you shall know who have studied and thought and seen the true ways and goings of life. And now will I go forward in my telling, and here will I set down a sure thing that I did perceive, both by mine ears and by my fingers, for, as I did make clear to you but a while gone, there had come a change into the air as I did go downward of the mighty slope. And truly I was come to a great and new deepness, even beyond that of the wondrous depth where did stand the last redoubt, so that I was afar down and in a monstrous night. And the air here was of a great thickness and abundancy, even as it might be the air of this our age, or maybe more or maybe less, for who may compare two matters with a sure guessing that do have an eternity to keep them asunder? And because that the air was grown very strong and apparent, it shall be, mayhaps, that it was by reason of this thing that the water, when I did make it, did fizz upward in a moment very loud and plentiful, and did boil overward to the earth from out of the cup, and wet upon my hand. And surely this thought did come very keen to my reason, as I did fumble each time of mine eating, there in the everlasting night and lonesomeness of the great slope. And so shall you have knowledge now of this and that thing which did come upon my thought, and of the little and the big wonders, and all shall help something to give unto you the ache of newness and bewilderment that was constant companion unto me. Now by this time, as I have said, I was gone downward ever for six great days, and I did seem as that I should presently come to the middle of the world, for of going downward there was no end. And then, when it did be that I was near ready to believe this, I perceived far off in the deep of the night a little shining that was yet weak and unsure. And I do not know whether I can truly give unto you the great astonishment and pain of hope that did come upon me. So that I grew sick in all my being but to behold once again the blessedness of light, and to have help unto my belief that I went not downward to an utter desolation. And I stood upward from my knees, and did look very earnest, and surely it did seem that a light was there afar downward in the night, and again it did seem that I must be plagued by my hopes and by my fancy, that there was nowhere any light. And then again I did see it very clear, and not to be mistaken, and I had a shaking to come upon me, and I gat me to a run, and made a great and mad speed down the dark slope. And lo, I was not gone any way, but I went headlong, and near break myself, and could but hold my teeth together very fierce and quiet, until that the pain was something gone from me. And afterward I gat me again to mine hands and knees, and went slowly as before, and so for a great hour or more, and did look oft, and alway the light became more plain to my sight, but ever to come and go oddly wise. Yet did I go for six hours, before that I was come anywise near to it. And by this shall you know how great a space off it had been. And lo, when that I did seem surely a nigh unto it, truly was it still far away in the night, and I came not indeed near to it until that I was gone onward again for three hours more. And all that time did I yet go downward into the night, but the slope now did not be so utter dark. Now presently I made a pause, and stood upward to my feet, so that I should the better perceive the light. And lo, as I did look toward it, I heard a faraway sound in the dark, as that something did set up a strange and monstrous piping in the night. And immediately I went to mine hands and knees among the stones of the slope, and kept myself low in the darkness, so that I should be the less plain to be seen, did any monster approach. But there came nothing to trouble me, and I went downward of the slope for yet another hour, 
and all the time that I did go, the sound of the piping grew more in the great eternity of the night upon the slope. And by this time I was come truly near unto the light, but yet did not behold it plainly, for it did burn beyond certain monstrous rocks that stood between. And I went to the left for maybe the half of a big mile, and all the while that I did go the piping made a mightier whistling in the night, and it did seem presently as that the earth sent forth the sound and revelry of wild roarings. And I went the more silent, and later did kneel among three rocks and peered forth for a while upon the place before me. And now, being come nigh unto the light, though yet it was not unhid from behind the great barriers of the uprising rocks, I perceived that I crouched within the mouth of a mighty gorge, and the left side was a great way off, and I saw it plain at whiles when the light did rise. But the light was to the right, and it was so wondrous great that it did make clear to me that a mountain was to that side of the gorge, and went upward into the everlasting night as it did seem for ever. And afar down the gorge I did see the shinings of strange fires, faint and a great way off and so was I come at last to the bottom of the mighty slope. Yet the gorge also to go downward, but not so great. And presently I did go forward again, and so did open the point of the rocks, as the sailors do say. And I saw now that there gushed forth a great blue flame from the earth, and the mighty rocks stood about it, as that they were olden giants grouped there to some strange service. And concerning this flame I was not overmuch astonished in my reason, for it had seemed to me as I drew an eye that the fire and the sound should be made by the roaring and whistling of a burning gas that did issue forth among the rocks. Yet truly, though it did be a natural matter, it was yet a wondrous sight, and set amazement on my senses, for the flame did dance and sway whitherward monstrously and sometimes did seem that it dropped so low as an hundred feet, and afterward went upward with a vast roaring unto the utter height, and did stand mighty and blazing, maybe a full thousand feet, so that the far side of the gorge was lit, and surely it was seven great miles off or more, and yet did show plain and wondrous. And the light did show me the flank of the mountain, that made the right-hand side of the gorge to go up measureless into the night. And so shall you perceive that I stayed a while among the rocks that were in the mouth of the gorge, that I should gaze upon this thing. But afterward I looked this way and that way, so that I should have a knowing of the place where I was come. And it was a wild and stark and empty place, as you must perceive and the far side did be great miles off, as I did say, and everywhere there was abundance of rock and lonesomeness. And before me there went the great and dim length of the gorge, and there were lights here and lights there in a great distance, and oft, as it did seem, the quiet dancing of lights in diverse places, but yet were these gone on the instant, and ever there was a strong and vacant silence upon that place. And presently, after that I had looked once more into the mighty dancing flame, and perceived nowhere any life around it, I went onward down the quiet gorge, and for a great way, as I journeyed was my path lit by the dancing of the blue flame, and oft should I seem to be going but dimly among the rocks, and my shadow faint and long, and lo, the flame would leap, and all the gorge come to a wondrous brightness, and my figure to shorten and the shadows to be black and strong. And so shall you perceive how I went. And oft did I turn me about to behold the dancing of the great light, for it was solemn to my spirit, even amid so much of greatness and eternity, to think upon that flame and to conceive that it had an utter age danced there at the foot of the mighty slope unseen through lonesome eternities. And this I do tell unto you, that thereby may you have some knowledge of the strangeness and the bitter loneliness of that place, which, in verity, 
did seem the expressing of all the lonesomeness of my wanderings. And all the time as I did go downward of the great gorge there sounded the blast of the roaring that was presently afar to my back, and the mountainsides did catch it here and in that place and sent it offwards with strange and improper echoings, as of a chill piping, or oddwise as hushed whisperings of monstrous creatures, so that I did oft stoop to hide a little among the boulders, for truly I knew not but that some unnatural thing called from the darkness of the mountainside. And for six hours I walked onward thus, and sometimes did I hide, having a sudden fear, as I have told. And presently, in a great while, the roaring was sunk to a far and monstrous piping, but in the end to no more than a far and uncertain whistling, that yet did catch strange echoes in the night. And in the end there was only a quietness. And yet, as you do perceive, there had been always a silence in that gorge, as I have told, and this to the despite of the whistling. And I do hope that you have understanding with me in this matter, for it was truly as I have told, and there is no contrariness of telling in this matter. Now in all this time that I had walked in the great gorge, I had passed four of the far lights that I did see from the bottom of the slope. And the two first and the fourth were blue, but the third was green, and all did dance and quake, and sent fitful shinings into the belly of the gorge and there came also from them whistlings, and from the second one a low and strange moaning noise, and I doubted not the gas did come oddly and with trouble. And I passed these things with no great thought, for truly they were no matters for notice, after that which I had beheld. Now, as you shall mind, it was surely in the early third of the seventh day of my journey down the mighty slope that I saw the first shining of the monstrous gas fountain, and from that time until now had there passed maybe sixteen hours. And, as you do what, I had eat not in all my travel since that I had seen the light, so that I was gone to a proper lack inward. And, moreover, it was full nineteen hours or more since that I had slept, and all that while had I labored and I ceased me from wandering, and looked about that I should come to a safe and proper place for my slumber, and this I saw very quick, for there was dry stone and rock everywhere, and no failing of holes in diverse places to my purpose, so that I was soon in a little cave between two mighty boulders. And here I eat four of the tablets, for truly so many were my due, and I had not been violent had I eat more and afterward I made some of the water, and it did fizz up in a moment, so that I perceived that but a good pinch made a great cupful. And this I set to the count of the strong and heavy air as I have told, which I did think to have a greater power of chemistry. And presently I slept, having my gear about me as ever, and the discos to my breast. And as I went into slumber I thought sweetly upon Nani as I had done, indeed, an hundred times since I was come to the hopefulness of the lights of the gorge. Now whilst I slept, I dreamed that the master word did presently beat all about me in the night. Yet, as I do mind, I waked not, and because that I continued to sleep I have no sure knowing whether this was truly a dream or an happening. And I minded me upon it when I waked. But this was after that I had slept seven hours, and I could have no sureness anywise of the matter, but only that I was come safe through my sleep, though heavy within my head and limbs, as that the air did call me unto a further slumbering, as is like enough. And after that I had eaten drunk, I put my gear about me and the discos to my hip, for I needed both my hands to the task of journeying amid the great boulders and I set forth again down the half-light of the mighty gorge, and through eighteen hours I made a strong going, save when I did pause at the sixth and twelfth hours to my eating. And by the eighteenth hour was come I was very ready to my food and slumber, and presently I was asleep in a place of the rocks. 
and that day had I passed three and twenty of the dancing gas-fires, and five been like a white fire, but the others blue and green, and all did dance and made a strange and uncertain light within the great gorge, yet was it a peaceful thing unto my spirit that there was truly light, as you shall understand. And I slept six hours and waked, and did want more sleep as you shall think. But I eat and drunk and put my gear upon me, and went on downward of the gorge. And at the sixth hour, after that I had eat and drunk, I came to a part where the big gas-fires did cease to dance, and there was a certain darkness upon that place. Yet was it not a proper dark? for there came the glimmer of a flame here and the glimmer of a flame there, as that little flames came upward between the stones, and did vanish, and come upward in another part. And so did light and die out constant and forever amid the stones and the boulders of that lonesome gorge, and made a low-spread light, so that it did seem unto me that strange shudders of light beat upward through the dark of that place. And I went onward, and a heavy fume did seem to hang in the air, and horrid gases to come upward from the earth in odd puffings, and anon a light would leap upward beyond the next stone, and afterward vanish, and there would be an hundred thousand such upon every hand running to and for, and afterward for a moment an utter dark, and again the little flames everywhere. So that it did seem I went one moment amid the heart of a strange country of fire, and immediately through a country of utter night. And this was to me strange, and a peculiar matter. Yet, as I do think, the gases did bother me the more, for they did seem as that they were like to hurt mine health utterly. For in verity oft did I seem that I should choke and breathe no more, by reason of the poison that came upward from among the stones and the boulders. And all that time, as they came or went, did the little flames make small flocks of sound in the gorge as they did flash or die, and the sounds did seem, to my likening, as stones cast into an utter silent pool, for they but made apparent the everlasting quiet of the gorge. And afterward I came beyond this place, and you shall see me going very lonesome among the rocks of the gorge beyond. And by this it was come nigh unto the eighteenth hour, and I did find a place proper to my slumber, and did eat and drink, and was quickly gone over unto sleep. And here I should tell how that I had not an over-fear of evil powers whilst I was in the great gorge, for truly it did seem as that nothing that ever did live came anigh to that wild and silent place of stone and rock, but that I journeyed through it alone, and was surely the first thing that did go that way for maybe a million years. And this feeling that was upon me I do hope you to perceive and to take unto yourselves, and thus have an understanding of my heart at that time. And, as you shall know, I went always unto slumber with sweet and with troubled thoughts of the maid. Yet, for a great while, I have been put so mightily to the labour of my way that my heart did suffer less at this time than should be thought. And truly it doth show me how I was drawn unto that one with all my being, that I did surely think so oft and sweetly upon her amid so many perils and matters of horror. And this doth seem something strange to say, when that you do consider that I was adventured unto these same perils and horrors, but only for the sake of the maid. And in six hours did I wake, as I did strive alway to set myself to do, yet was I very heavy and slow for a little, until that I was more properly come to wakefulness. And surely, as I did think before, this was like to be put upon me by the weighty air of the place. But yet it might be that the gas which did float in the gorge was upon my lungs. And also, as you have perceived, if but you have attended my way, the air was grown warm, and oft were the rocks pleasant to the seat, and all of these matters did contrive to make me slumberous. Now presently the gas-fires did cease utterly in the gorge, and I looked downward along that great place, and saw only a grayness, 
but above the grayness there was, as it did seem, something of a vague and ruddy shining in the night. And this did wake me to wonder what new thing lay before, so that I grew more eager among the boulders. And later, when I had eaten at the sixth and twelfth hours, and gone on a while, I came to a place where the gorge made a quick turning unto my left, and at the end of the turning was a red and glowing light that was very great and wonderful. So that I was utter keen to come to that place, that I should discover what made the shining. And the place where I was come then was very dark, because that I was nigh under the mighty wall of the mountain of the right side of the gorge. Yet above, as it did seem to me, there was a far red upward glowing in the night. Then did I go forward very fast, and presently, in a good while, I discovered that I drew near to a second great turning that went to the right. And about the seventeenth hour I came nigh unto the second great turning. And here did I put caution upon me, and crept for a while among the dark rocks of that place, that I should come unto a sight of that which made the monstrous red shining. And presently I was beyond the corner of the mountain, and did look downward into a mighty country of seas, and the burning of great volcanoes. And the volcanoes did seem as that they burned in the seas, and the country was full of a great ruddy light from the volcanoes. And so shall you perceive me there among the rocks that did all stand upward strange and bold and silent in the red and monstrous glare of the light. And I, as it did seem, the one thing of life in all that desolation and eternity of rock and stone, there in the end part of the great gorge. And I peered forth into the wonder of the light, and was full of thrillings and fancies that I was surely come to the place where the lesser redoubt had been builded. And immediately I knew that this was not so. For sure, had not Nani told how that they were in a land of darkness. And if this be so, truly, how wondrous and dread a way I had yet to go, if that this country of seas and mighty volcanoes stood between. Surely it did seem to me then as that I must wander searching unto the world's end. And so shall you be company unto me there with my trouble and my thoughts, and the immediate wonder and strange glory of that mighty country. End of chapter 8《Chapter 9 Part 1 of The Nightland by William Hope Hodgson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Nightland, Chapter 9 The Dark Pyramid, Part 1. Now in two hours more I was come clear down out of the gorge and stood in that country, and for all that I did feel fresh troubled and bewildered, yet was I rejoiceful, as you may believe, in the surprising light and splendor of that sudden land. And before that I had come down out of the great gorge, I had stood high within the mouth thereof, and looked well out over the mighty country. And I counted seven and twenty great volcanoes, and this doth not take heed of two monstrous ranges of fire-hills that burned afar off, something unto my right. Neither doth it take account of an hundred thousand lesser places of fire. And truly it did seem a very land of fire and water, for there was a small fire-hill stood within a sea, as it did seem no more than a little mile from that place where I did stand, and maybe a score to the back of it spread all about. And here shall I do proper to tell concerning the seas. For there were of these that I did count at that time, three that were small, and a mighty sea that went onward for ever into the red light of the fire-hills, so that it was gone utterly out of my sight, and did show no ending. And there rose up out of the seas islands, and on the islands volcanoes. But in other parts the fire-hills did come upward straightly from the sea and over the near sea, as it did seem, there lay a plentitude of steam, as that the sea did boil at whiles and in diverse places. 
and there did seem to me, as it were within the red atmosphere of that place, as that there were a muttering thunder, low and constant, shaking the air, now from that distance and now from this, and this did I judge to be the voices of the fire-hills, speaking with the fire that lived in them. And you shall conceive how utter new was all this unto me, for there was in that country a constant voice of the energy of life, so that the world-noise of this our age was even there again, and with a keen and undoubted apparentness, and the more so some ways than now. And here shall I set down more closely the things that were ready to my gaze. And first, that it did much attract me, there was a huge and blackened mountain unto the left of the mouth of the gorge, and the mountain did go upward into the night maybe fifteen and maybe twenty miles. And there was a mighty peaked volcano that grew out from the side of the mountain so high up as five miles, as I did guess that height. And this was upon the far side. And above this there was a second, maybe nine or ten great miles up in the blackness of the night that hung afar upward. And as that this were not great wonder enough, there did burn and glow two other mighty fire-hills, at an utter height, upon the left crest of that black mountain. And these were upward so monstrous away, as that they did seem to make strange and smouldering suns within the night. And truly, as you shall perceive, this was a wondrous thing. And below these upward fire-hills there rose up from the earth vast mountains of ash and burned stuff that had been cast forth by these perched volcanoes, and had poured downward unto the earth throughout eternity, and so build grey and sombre monuments unto the dreadful glory of time. And to my right there was always sea and sea and the red blazing of the fire-hills, but unto my left there were mighty forests, and there rose upward here and in that place, as that they were beyond the great woods, monstrous fire-hills. And so do you take from me something of that first impressing upon my brain and sense. And after that I had come down out of the mouth of the great gorge, as I did tell a little while gone, I came upon a pause, for surely which way was the way proper into my search? And I looked about for a great while, and afterward did climb back into the gorge, and called myself foolish, that I had not thought to map my way ere I came down. And when I was come up into the gorge again, lo, I saw that there was but one way that I should go. For truly, as I have said, there was only the seas unto my right, but unto the left, where the shores did meet the seas, there seemed, so far as mine eyes did tell to me, a clear way for a space. And mayhap, when I had come so far, I should even find a further way to go forward. And so did I descend again unto the country of the seas, as I did ever call that red shining country of water and fire. And by that I was come again from the height of the gorge, it was four and twenty hours since that I did last sleep, so that I was fain that I should put into some nook and come to slumber, as you shall well believe. And I found me a neat and proper place, where three great trees grew about a little basin of rock that was very dry and warm. And here, after that I had eat three of the tablets, and drunk some of the water, the while that my belly did yearn, as ever, for proper eating stuff, I made my bed in the little basin of the rock, and lay me down, and did begin to think a while upon Nani, but was gone over to sleep before that I was aware. And lo, I was suddenly awake, and did find that I swam in a hot water, and a mercy, I did think, was it that I was not drowned as I did sleep and I got me to my feet, and the basin was full of water, hot and steaming, and pungent to the taste, as well I did know. And I perceived now that the water poured in from a smooth slit upon the far side, and it come with a strange gurgling and bubbling, so that I conceived some deep well to boil, and thus to drive upward this water into the basin, and glad was I that it did not boil as it came forth. And surely, now that I was upon the dry land, and did consider, I did quickly suppose that the water had poured forth at seasons into the basin for an eternity of time, and afterward did go back by fissures in the bottom of the basin, and this to happen, as I soon did find, a little beyond the length of every hour, 
and indeed the basin to empty slow, as I did watch. Now, being much wetted, I stripped off mine armor, having before this dipped out mine effects from the hot pool, and so did come down to the naked flesh, and I found a place where the rock was hot, and here I did spread my garments. And whilst that they came to dryness, I get me into the hot pool, and had a very pleasant bathing, and did have no great fear of any dangerous thing. For, as it did seem, I had surely left all such behind within the nightlands. Yet did I have the discos upon the pool edge to my hand, for I had no proper assurance in this matter. Yet, as it did prove, there were many monstrous beasts in that country, but never did I feel the nearness and horrid power of any evil force. For these, as I do conceive, were congregate and gathered about the mighty pyramid, being attracted thereto by the great spiritual essence of so wondrous a multitude of humans gotten so close in one spot, even as sharks do come after the ship that hath bullocks within. Yet how that the evil powers were given entrance unto the state of our life, I have no sure knowing, yet have I put forward certain thoughts on this matter in an earlier place. And more than such thinkings is surely vanity, for there is no certainty in my reasoning concerning the thing. Now presently was my clothing dry, yet before this I had come out from that bath which truly was nigh all gone backward into the earth and I dressed me again and got my armor upon me, and afterward was I in a more lightsome state of mind, and yet very ready to come again unto my sleep. And this I did, and had six hours more beside the pool, and once was wakened somewhat by the gruntling and bubbling noise of the water, that was made as the pool did fill time and again. And when the six hours were gone, I waked very well fitted in my senses and feelings to go forward again through that red-lighted country, and this I did, after that I had eat and drunk. Now all that day I went forward at a great pace, and the nameless woods were unto my left, and the shores of the seas unto my right. And oft did I find that the trees grew even into the water, so that oft did I go forward among the trees, and a very wonderful thing was this to me, that never had known before in all my life, until I was come into that country, how that a glad and wild mystery doth live among forest trees. For there was no such strange wildness among the groves of the underground fields, though a solemn beauty in plenty. And the scent of the woods was sweet unto my spirit, as you shall what. Now all the time that I did go, there was the shore unto my right, but alway to my left, and around me oft times, as I did say, the great forests. And as I did go, lo, there was life in all those darksome woods, and living eyes did peer out odd wiles upon me, and afterward go backward into the dark, so that I wotted not whether to fear, or to have no heed of trouble. Yet naught did come anigh to me, to make any hurt. And thrice in that day did I come to little fire-hills that burnt redly, and sent out fire and noise, so that I heard their trouble each time through the forest, before that I was come to them. And about each was there a deadness and desolation, where the fire had killed the big trees. Yet, as I did observe, the quick life of little plants did grow more nigh, as that they were born and lived between the times of the fire-bursts. And this I do take it that you perceive." And in that one day I passed thirty and seven boiling springs. But whether they boiled truly, I do have no knowledge, only that they sent out a great steam oft times, and some did make a strong roaring noise, so that to hear them afar off in the forests was to think odd times that some wild beast roared strangely. Now when the eighteenth hour was come, I sat me down, as I had done upon the sixth and twelfth hours, and eat two of the tablets, and drank some of the water, which here did fizz very rich and quick. And afterward I lay down to my slumber, for I was greatly wearied. And I had chosen a place against a great rock, which was so that no creature might come upon me from behind. And I came easy upon sleep, but yet I did fix it upon me that I slumber only with the body, for I did know by the shining of the eyes in the darksome woods that strange creatures abode in the mighty forests. And ere I was gone over to sleep, 
I thought upon Nani, as I had done much all that day, as though her spirit did hover near unto mine, and did strive pitiful to speak with me. And this I set out to you, that you shall know how it did seem unto me in my thoughts and fancyings. And as I lay there, I put a blessing upon her, and a determination into my heart that I make a more desperate speed of my going, if that might be, so that I come the sooner to that strange and unknown place in the dead world, where did stand the lesser refuge. And I was then asleep in a moment. And lo, sudden I was awake, and lovely was the brightness of that country, that did show me in a moment my danger, and did not keep me suspend in fearful doubt, as did the grey darkness and strange shadows and lights of the nightland. For I saw, on the instant that I got me to my elbow, how that certain things did crouch within the borders of the trees, no more than a score paces off. And I perceived in a moment that my spirit had been given knowledge, and had wakened me. And I stared, the while that I did grip the discos, and I saw that there were six squat men that were humped at the neck and shoulder, and they did crouch all there in a row, and were something hid by the shadows and I perceived that they watched me, and the eyes of the men did shine like the eyes of beasts, and so shall you know somewhat of the strange terror that came upon me. Yet had I the discos and mine armor, and though my heart did shake a little, yet was my spirit assured to conquer. Now I got me to my feet and had the discos ready within my hand, and behold, I could not see the humped men, for they were gone from that place yet never did I see them go, though I had kept my gaze very steadfast upon that part where they did hide. And, as you shall understand, I was near ready to believe that there had been nothing there within the border of the wood, yet truly I knew that the men with the humps had been there, as I had seen. Now I looked presently, and found that I had slept five hours, and I eat two of the tablets as I did stand there, watchful, and afterward drank some of the water and so was ready to go forward again, for I was grown very anxious to be gone from that place, and did have no knowledge but that those strangely humped men were but a little way off among the trees, and might come upon me in a moment, or further that they did go to call an army of other humped men to my destruction. And after that I was ready and had my gear secure upon me, I set off at a great stride and did hold the discos very handy, and looked this way and looked that way, and all the while made onward with speed. For truly I was grown so lean and hard that it did seem to me that I had power to outpace those men or aught else of their kind. And all that day through thirty great hours did I go forward at that stride, and did always watch and at every sixth hour I eat two of the tablets and drank a little of the water and went onward again. And so did I hope that I was lost from those humped men. Yet, though I did hope, my faith was not this wise. For twice and thrice did it come to me that there went things through the woods to my left all that day, and did keep always to a level with my speed, yet were always hid. And, as you shall believe, this did be a very shaking thing to my heart, and did make my hope of but little account. Now, because that I had no faith to company my hope, I was not easy to have slumber, until that I was come to a place proper and safe. And so, as I have told, I went onward through thirty great hours, and in truth in all that while I did find nowhere that did seem to fit my need. And lo, about the end of the thirtieth hour I perceived that there was water ahead, besides the water of the sea that was ever to my right and I thought, maybe, that the sea did go inward at that part of the land. But it was otherwise. For when I was gotten to that place, I found that a river came into the sea and did come out of all the country that lay unto my left. And in the mouth of this river there was a small island. And surely I did look across to the island and think it a refuge from the humped men that did surely play dog upon my going. Yet truly this was but an idle thought and my need was that I should come to some way to cross over the river, that I go forward beside the great sea, which did stretch onward as it did seem forever before me upon the far side. 
and I knew not how to go across. For I had no power to swim, and had I swum, there were surely monsters in that great and warm flowing river, as you shall believe. And I went upward of the river bank that I might come to some place where the river did narrow, and surely I had been like to walk a mighty distance to this purpose, but that I came soon to a second river that did enter the first, not a mile above the shore of the sea. So that, as you do perceive, there was the sea to one side of me, and this second river unto the other, and the first river before me. And thus was I sorely perplexed, as any had been truly that was in a like trouble. Yet, as it did chance, the need to go forward and the danger of the humped men put wit into me, so that I looked about for a tree that was fallen. And there were many, yet great, so that I was much wearied and something strained of the spirit, before that I got two little trees unto the water. Now when this was done I made me a rough pole of a young tree-plant, and afterward I lashed the two trees together with my belts and straps, and so had somewhat of a raft. And you shall picture that, all the time as I did go about this business, I was very heedful lest the humped men should come upon me, ere that I was gone free upon the water. And this constant heeding did double the labour of my work, as you shall perceive. Yet in the end it was done, and I was ready to adventure over the river. And so I did push off with the pole, and I pushed and paddled maybe the half of an hour, for indeed it was all a clumsy contriving, and mayhap I the more so in my labours. Yet presently I was come so far over that I drew nigh to the island and it did seem a wise and proper thing that I should have my slumber there, and afterward go onward to the farther shore. And this I did, and after that I had eaten drunk as ever, I lay down to sleep. And by this time it was three and thirty hours since last I did slumber, so that I was bitterly awearied. And I had a great and restful sleep, for truly the island did seem a very safe place and in verity I came to no harm, though I was as a dead man for nine great hours, and so shall you perceive my weariness. And when I was come proper awake, I eat two of the tablets and drank some of the water, and afterward made an end of my voyage, and then did take back my belts and straps from binding the trees, and so forward again upon my way, and no more fearful of the humped men. For surely, I did think I had left them all upon the far shore of the river, though afterward I minded me that they might grow likewise upon the two sides, but yet was I only discovered by those upon the one, as you do know. And all that day I went very swift, and passed many strange matters, and did coast upon wonders oft. And at the sixth and the twelfth hours did I eat and drink, as ever and between the eighth and the fourteenth hours did I come past two mighty fire-hills that made all the country to tremble with their noise. And four times did monstrous creatures pass by me, but I was swift hid and came to no harm. And oft as I did go were my thoughts upon the dear maid that I journeyed to save from destruction. Yet, as you must see, always were my thinkings brought sharply unto my going so that scarce was I ever set off to ponder upon Nani, but that there came some danger or wonder to give me heed to my way. And because of this, as you have learned, I was more put to plan free of the instant trouble and peril of my way through all that mighty journey than to have quiet chance for thoughts of love unto mine own. Yet truly was not my journey one whole thought of love unto Nani? and that peril made oft dumb my brain was but the truer song unto my maid. And at times I was among trees, but oft did I go past unnumbered boiling springs and small fire-hills, and oft was the air full of the noise of the little fire-hills and the roar of the boiling springs, but there came no harm unto me. And a thousand times did I perceive things that had life, and I made a very cautious way though with a great speed and cleverness of going that made my heart glad. And oft did I come to parts where a great life held the trees, and green stuff did flourish exceedingly, and the air rich and full and wondrous sweet, so that I was fain to think how that in some far-off time it might be that our children's children should come down unto this country, 
when the upper valley of the nightland was grown to an utter chill and lacking of air, and here build them a new refuge, if indeed any should come clear of the evil forces and the monsters that did live about the mighty pyramid in the nightland. Yet how should they come clear of those things, so that this is, as you do perceive, no more than a thought that did rise vaguely in me? And yet again, who shall say what may be? And onward I did pass, and I do mind me how that I saw the lower fires of that country to burn very fierce, and this I set to the richness of the air, but yet with no surety of knowledge, and do but tell the same that you shall see the oddments of thought that went oft across my brain, and so have so much knowledge as I concerning this and that. Now a little before the eighteenth hour was come, I came out from among the trees, and the sea was downward of a great cliff unto my right, for I had gone upward for a long and weary hour. And I did see now a thing that made me to be cautious, and yet that did hold my heart to go swiftly to perceive the thing, for it was very strange. And I went forward quickly, yet with a wise care, and so was come presently more nigh and I perceived that the thing was in part a high rock, very tall and pointed, and maybe an hundred feet high, but afterward I did find it to be more. And there was a monstrous great thing upon the top of the rock that did seem very strange, and I stopped and looked, and afterward went forward again, and so for a time until that I was but a little way off and now I saw that there did seem to be a mighty long rock laid across the topmost part of the upstanding rock, and yet had a very strange and shapely appearance, and did seem upon the under part to be as that I looked before upon it. And upon the upper part there grew trees and green things, even as these did grow upon odd ledges of the upstanding rock. Yet for the most part the rock was very stark as that a blast had blown upon it and made it bare. Now when I had looked for a while I bethought me that this should be a safe and proper place for my slumber, if that I had power to come safe to the top. And when I had thought this thing I began at once to climb up the rock, and I found that the rock was very high, so that in a while I was come a great way off the earth, and yet was not come to the top of the rock and because that I was a-wearied I looked about for a safe place to mine hand, and lo, there was a shelf of the rock very nigh, that went inward a little to the side. And I gat me to this ledge, and did eat and drink, and presently I slept, and scarce had thought of Nani in the moment of my slumbering, for a great weariness was upon me, the which I do think to have come by reason that I was not yet proper rested from the task of the day that was gone before that one. End of chapter 9, part 1and I had knowledge within me that my spirit did wot of some nigh danger. And I get upward from the rock very quiet, and had the discourse ready in my hand. And I looked swift about me in the moment that I did wake, yet did see nothing, for there was naught on the ledge with me. And I crept to the edge and looked downward. And lo, I did see that there came up the rock two humped men, and they did climb very swift and silent and I perceived that they smelled me and came to destroy me. And I made ready the discos to do battle, and ceased not to look downward. And I saw how that the humped men did seem to be humped by reason of their being so monstrous thick and mighty of the neck and the shoulder, as that they had been human bulls. And I saw that they were very strong, and by the speed of their climbing I knew they were swift, and so did I make steady my attention and my heart to the saving of my life for truly I did know that I should be dead in a little, or they. Now I stepped back a space from the edge of the rock, and had the discourse very ready, 
for it was needful that I should kill one of those brute men speedy, that I have no danger that one take me in the back whilst that I fight with the other. Then in a moment it did seem, there came upward of the rock edge the great and brutish face of the man. And in that moment that I slew him, I did note curiously how that he had large teeth upon each side of the mouth and was aware that he had come so quiet as a great cat. And in the backward parts of my brain I bethought that even thus, maybe, was primal man, so that a strange and secondary questioning and wondering did live in that part of me. And I did learn from these scarce conscious reasonings that I was of the belief the thing was truly a man, but very crude and dangerous. And surely it is strange that I had all this thought in that little moment, but in verity so it was, though I doubt not but I bettered it with afterthoughts when a while had gone. Now the first man died ere his great haired breast was come upward over the rock, and he sank back and sagged and fell dully, and I heard him bodge downward from rock to rock, very lumbersome, and so in a moment was silence. Then did I look this way and that of the ledge, for the second humped man was not yet upon me, and I feared that the pause did mean a cunning mischief and strategy. And when a little time had passed, and all the while I was ready with the discos, and naught did come upward to harm me, I stepped very soft to the edge of the rock ledge and looked downward, but there was nowhere anything to see. Now for a little moment I did think that the brutish man had run off, being feared by the death that I did deal unto the first. Yet I put this from me at once, for I did wot that such a creature did not like to be fear in such wise, but was rather set to some horrid cunning of attack, as I did fear, and was somewhere below me among the holes of the great rock. Then I did think sudden that he might be gone upward, so that he should come down upon my back, and I looked upward of the mighty rock but did see naught, and afterward I stooped forward a great way beyond the edge, so that I should perceive whether the man did hide beneath. And behold, he was there below me, and crouched under the rock-shelf ready to his spring. And in that moment he made unto me with so mighty a leap as any tiger should give, and he came half over the edge and gripped the discos by the handle in an instant and surely I had lost that trusted weapon or been pulled over and cast into the depth, but that the discos did spin and the earth-current did make live the handle, as was intended, save where the grip was set. And lo, the man gave loose the handle very swift, for it had burned and shaken the creature sore. And I staggered back with the effort I had made to withhold the discos, and the brutish man came upward again over the rock-edge and leapt at me. Yet he gat me not, for I sprang into my right and made a blow with the discos even as I did leap. And the blow came something short, but yet harmed the humped man with a gash upon the belly, very sore and horrid among the great brown hairs of the man. And immediately he sprang after me, but I smote full at the face, so that he leapt back from the strange roar and blaze of the discos, and yet was harmed for he got not right free of the blow, but did be cut very sore on the mighty and haired arm. Now seeing that he was something feared of the weapon, I ran in upon him, and smote again at the face. Yet was the man gone out of my reach before that the blow did reach, for truly he was quick as a panther, and immediately he did leap unto the ending of the ledge, where it did join upon the rock, and he caught the living rock between his two hands and truly the rock must have been splitten there, for he tore out a monstrous lump so great near as my body, and did run upon me with the rock above the head of him. Now I perceived I should be smashed in a moment, if that I did not slay the man very quick, for so mighty was he that he did leap this way and that way after me, as though the great rock did cumber him no more than it had been but a light matter and you shall perceive that I leapt this way and that way to avoid the man, and twice did strike him, but yet was feared to break the discos upon the rock, which the man did use as a shield each time that I did make a blow. 
and all the while I did act to escape when that the man should cast the rock, as I did conceive at the first to be his intent. Yet truly it was as that he had no wadding that a rock may be thrown, for he strave only to come at me with the rock that he should crush me as with a monstrous club. And in verity what should a man do against so horrid an attack? And time and oft did I leap now to the right and now to the left, and again in a moment I did cut the humped man. But the blow was something turned off by the great rock in the hands of the man, yet so strange and mighty was the power of the discos that it shore away a small portion of the rock and did come to no hurt in itself. And surely I had presently failed in wind and limb, because of the leapings and chargings that I did make, and because of the weight of the armor that was not overmuch yet to be considered, but that I fainted not was by reason of the wondrous hardness and leanness that I was grown to, with so constant a journeying and straight living, for the tablets did keep the strength in a man, though truly they ease not the yearnings of the belly. And lo, even the brutish man did grow weary, and the hot breath and body stink to come from him, and surely who shall wonder, for always he did rush to and fro upon me, with the monstrous rock to crush me. And sudden I leapt unto the right of the man, thinking within me that I did perceive a chance that I should cut him upon that side, but truly he was less a weary than I did know, for he came very sharp upon me and had me between him and the wall of the rock, and surely I had no room to make escape, and had died in a moment, but that I made a sudden sham toward the left with the discos, as that I should leap that way. And in the same instant, I did go to the right with a strong bounding, and immediately did come in upon the humped man from that side. And I put my fortune of life to the stroke, and stood anigh to the man, and I smote him across the middle part, before that he did wot of my intent. And the blow slew the man very surely, and did nigh cut the mighty creature in twain. And surely he fell, half leaping even as he died so that the monstrous rock that was in the hands of the brutish man did crash down almost upon my feet, and I leapt very high that I should escape the thundering of the rock, for in verity I was near slain in that last moment of the life of the humped man. But yet I lived and came free of death, and did have a relief of happiness about my heart, as you shall believe. Yet truly I was much shaken, and a little weakness took me so that I was fain to go down upon the rock-shelf that I have back my strength. And presently I was grown steady again, and I took my gear and did haste down the rock, and so was come presently to the earth again. And I saw the first of the humped men that I did slay, lying very quiet a little off from the bottom of the rock, so that I went round upon the other side to avoid the man, for it was no pleasure to mine eyes or to my heart and truly it did trouble me always to make a death. And when I was come round upon the other, which was the seaward side of the rock, I perceived that I was yet shaken, and I remembered that it were wise to eat and drink and rest a little before that I did go further upon my way. Now as I did sit there at the bottom of the rock, I looked upward at the strange crown thereof, and until that time I had been taken up with the fight and with the gazings this way and that, to see whether there came others of the humped men to work me in harm. But now that I was given some ease of the mind and of the body, I saw plainly that I knew the thing that lay upward upon the rock. For the shape had been something strange and half known to me even before that moment, as that I had a vague knowledge concerning it, but yet with no surety and now, truly, I did know in a little instant that the thing was one of the olden flying ships, the which, as you shall mind, there were certain in the great museum of the mighty pyramid. And surely I was ready to wonder why that I had not seen the thing plain before that moment, yet was this like to be because that there was a shadow upon the other side of the great rock, but upon this side there was a little fire-hill away off to the cliff-edge, and this did throw a warm light that made a glimmer upon the dull metal of the ship's bottom, which was uncovered to my sight, and was surely of that same deathless grey metal that made the great redoubt. And yet, as you shall believe, 
even as I said this thing to my mind, that the strange matter upon the top of the rock was truly one of the olden airships, I did feel that I should be proper to doubt. For it was a very wondrous thing to perceive a thing common to man in that utter strange country, and after that I was gone so far off from the mighty pyramid. Yet, in verity, I did know in my heart that it was indeed that which I did perceive it to be. And I did stand and walk to and for and look upward constant, for I was very keen that I look well upon it. And truly, as I did look from this place and from that place, it was scarce a thing for wonder that I had not watered it to be an air-vessel, for there were great trees and abundance of earth and living matters upon the topmost side of the ship, so that none could easy perceive it to be aught save a great and desolate rock that did lie upon the other rock. Yet truly it was as I have told, and presently I did make to climb upward of the great rock, that I should come to the air-vessel to enter it. But yet was this not proper, for I had surely no duty save to go forward for ever until that I found the maid, but yet did I spend a little while to the searching of the ship, and I do but set down that which I did, and with a serious spirit. And truly, as it doth here occur to me, I do be ever seeming a serious young man, as you maybe shall have grown to think, but yet was I to a dread and serious business, and the strain did be too great upon me, and the trouble too much pressed upon my heart, to give me much of laughter, as you do surely perceive, and so you to give me your ear and your understanding. For, indeed, before that I did lose Murdath my beautiful one, I was not over-grave, but so young and joyous as any. Now it took me a great time to go upward of the rock, for it was so monstrous steep and high. Yet presently was I come nigh under the bottom of the ship, and here I did perceive that she had been sore battered in that far-off age when she did come upon the rock, for surely, as I did perceive, the peak of the rock was through the bottom of the ship, so that the metal was burst this way and that, and very plain to be seen in some parts. But in other places the earth and growing matters did make a hiding. And after that I had climbed this way and that way, I perceived that I must come to the topmost part by the plants that did hang over and grow downward. And after that I had pulled upon them, to know that they were strong to hold me, I went upon them and was soon to the top of the ship. Yet truly I might so well have been upon the earth, for the ship was covered above by the earth and dust of a monstrous age of years, so that I was like to need much time to dig downward unto the ship and because of this I considered a little while, and afterward made no more to search her, but did go downward again, that I should come once more to my journey. Yet, as you shall think, it was with a queer thrilling of the heart, and with strange thoughts upon the end of those that did come, maybe, to a bitter and lonesome dying in that ship of the air, in that far-off time when she did fly and surely it did seem to me as I went downward of the great rock how that the flying-ship had been there for an hundred thousand years, and that mayhaps the sea did live all about the rock in that age, and truly this was no improper thing to think, for it was like that the sea had been monstrous high and great in those days, so that the rock was but a little island in the midst of the sea. And now was the sea gone small from a great sea to lesser seas, and this through an eternity of years. And always, as it doth seem to me, had the ship lain upon the rock, and looked quiet and silent over the change and wonder and the lonesomeness of all that country of fire and water for ever. But how the airship did come upon the rock, how shall I know? Save, maybe, it doth seem as that she might have flown low over the sea in that olden age, and came hard upon the rock because, maybe, there was one to the helm that did steer unwittingly. And again it shall well be otherwise, and I do but set down mine odd thoughts, and such as they be they have no especial use, save that they do show to you the different workings of my mind at that time, as I did go downward. And so to set you the more in possession of all that I did have knowledge of. And presently I was come again to the earth, and did go forward with a great speed, so that I should waste no more of that day. 
yet oft did I think upon that ship hid there upon the mighty rock, under the wondrous quiet ashes of eternity. And I went eighteen hours walking, and in all that time I did see no more of the humped men. Yet three times I was put in a sudden danger, for there went past me thrice, between the fourteenth and the seventeenth hours, great flying monsters, that were winged very ugly, and did go, as I thought, in a great bounding, rather than that they did fly proper as doth a bird. Yet I suffered no hurt from these, for I was swift to hide between the great boulders that were very plenty in that part, but no trees. For I was gone now past the forests of trees, there being none since that I had gone through a very shallow river that I came to about the thirteenth hour, and this I had waited and sounded my path with the staff of the discos, but I had kept mine armor upon me, lest there be things, even in water so shallow, that might bite and work harm upon me. But I got through pretty quick, and had no hurt done me. Now I had eat as ever at the sixth and the twelfth hours. And by that the eighteenth hour was come, I was nigh again unto a forest, that came down to the very shore that went all way upon my right. And I to be very sore and wearied, as you shall know, for I had fought very desperate after my waking, and afterward climbed the great rock, and then again to journey, so that it was by this nigh to one and twenty hours since that I did sleep. And surely I looked this way and that way constant, and did see no place proper to my slumber. But afterward I considered I did be a fool, to lack such, for truly the trees were plentiful, and I could climb a great one and strap my body safe, and so have a sure bed for my rest. And I did this thing, and went upward into a great tree, and did tie my body to the tree with my belts, yet I eat and drank before that I went up the tree. Now when I was fast upward in the tree, and had made a bed upon a monstrous branch, and had the discos ready upon my hip, so that it should not fall but be nigh to my hand, I lay a little while thinking upon Nani and I went not over to sleep immediately, which was strange, yet mayhaps because that my bed was so uncertain. And I considered very gravely how that it was a monstrous long while since that I did hear the master word from the dear maid, and truly I was come a dreadful way from mine home, which was the mighty pyramid. For I had gone onward for ever through five and twenty great days of travel and was not yet come to any place that did appear like to be that place where the maid did abide. And it did seem that I might even wander onward in that great country of fire and water, for a time beyond all that I had before gone. And this thought did put a great weight of trouble and weariness upon my heart. For the maid had been in sore need of me, and I did feel sudden to be all adrift in the wilderness. But before this time it had seemed as that I surely went aright, and mayhaps your sympathy shall tell you just how I to feel in the heart. And after that I had lain there very awkward and thought upon all matters, I minded me that I would try the compass again upon the morrow, but had no great hopes of the machine, yet did be willing to try aught to see where I had gotten to. And truly, as it did come to my mind, if that the compass did point a little as I did what it was used to a point in the lesser redoubt, then in verity I was surely come something more anigh to that unknown place of the world than I did dare to believe, and this to be plain to you. Then a little time did pass in which I did wake and sleep and wake and sleep a little, but with no surety of sleep, but as that I was very tired of the heart and did but lie too weary to come properly to sleep and odd whiles I did lie with mine eyes half to open, and to look very dreamful upward among the dark branches of the tree, as they did show black and pretty against the redness of the shining that came from the sea, for there was stood a great and bright burning fire-hill in that part of the sea that lay off the shore from me. And above the glaring of the fire-hill there was the deep night that did brood for ever above in a monstrous black gloom of eternity and did make the red smoke of the volcano to show deep and mighty and thunderous seeming, afar up in the great dark. And the red and shining smoke did but show the utter hugeness of the night, 
that had been upon the world through the great ages. And in verity, as I did lie there so dreamful, it did come to me afresh how wondrous strange was mine adventure, and how that I did lie warm and alive in a country of red light and smoking seas. And truly, as I did remember and consider, there was a great and lost world above me, upward through the dark, maybe an hundred and fifty great miles up in the grim night. And this thing did strike me very solemn, as I did lie, and I do trust that you conceive how that there was in truth afar above in the eternal and unknown night the stupendous desolation of the dead world, and the eternal snow and starless dark. And, as I do think, a cold so bitter that it held death to all living that should come anigh to it. Yet bethink you if one had lived in that far height of the dead world, and come upon the edge of that mighty valley in which all life that was left of earth did abide, they should have been like to look downward vaguely into so monstrous a deep that they had seen naught, perhaps, save a dull and utter strange glowing far downward in the great night in this place and in that. And surely, as you have seen, I have set the great deep of the valley to be maybe an hundred and fifty miles of night, for as you do mind, it was conceived that the valley of the nightland was an hundred miles deep and may hap to be more. And I had come from that place downward of the mighty slope and of the gorge a very great way. Yet, in verity, I do believe in my heart this measuring was utter wrong, for I think the deep to have been monstrous, beyond these miles that I do give. Yet have I no proving of this belief, and do set it down for no more than it is. Now presently I had ceased from these vague thinkings and half-dreamings, and was gone truly to sleep. Yet nowise did I sleep very strong but did seem to come anigh to wakefulness this time and that. And as it did chance, this was mayhaps a very good thing for my life, for I did presently come awake more surely, and did turn on the great branch, for there was a noise in the air that was not the noise of the great fire-hill. And the noise did grow very heavy and lumbersome, and in a moment there came seven humped men, running among the trees, as that some monstrous thing did pursue. And immediately they were beneath the tree in which I did lie, so that a great fear came upon me, and I loosed the belt from the branch that I should be free to fight. And directly upon this I saw that the men did leap upward into the tree beneath me, but not as that they did wot of me or make to come at me, but as that they did pay a great heed to some creature or happening that was far off among the trees and surely the noise did seem to come from that part, and did grow loud and mighty, and the humped men did all crouch very silent, and did make no noise or motion one to the other, but were quiet upon the lower branches. And as I did look now more to my ease, I perceived that they each had a great stone, and bloody, that did seem that it were split to a certain sharpness, even as a stone doth break very natural and they carried the stone under this arm or under that arm, so that they had their hands free to all matters. And alway the noise did come more anigh, and I saw that a humped man did come running from among the trees, and did run beneath that place where the seven humped men did be on the branches. But they made no sign to the man to save him, yet truly it was very plain that some monster pursued the man and immediately I saw how this thing was. For the humped man upon the ground did not run so fast as might be, and I conceived that he did act to make some creature to come after him, to pass under the men within the tree. And surely this thing did prove to be, for there came very quick a great and ugly thing, that had an ugly way of putting down the feet, and did have seven feet to each side, which was very strange and the back was as that it were horny, and the belly of the thing did seem to brush heavy upon the earth, and it grunted as it went and shook the earth with the weight of it, so that a monstrous noise came from it, upon so hasty a journey. And I did wot that it was not such a thing as did properly pursue after matters of food, but did rather eat of that which did need little haste, but a monstrous strength to gain. 
and that it did so make after the man was in truth because that it had been wounded and made fierce, for indeed there came blood from the creature from great wounds upon the back, but how these were made I could not know in that instant. And it did go under the tree in which I was hid, and in that moment when it passed under the tree the seven humped men did leap out of the branches and did catch to the brute by the great horns of the spine, and I saw that the wounds were in the joints of the spine, as was plain when the back did work, with the going of the creature. And the seven humped men took the sharp stones from under their arms, and did strike very brutal in the wounds that were in the joints of the spine, and the creature roared and cried, and went onward into the trees at a great speed. And in all the time that it ran the humped men ceased not to strike with the stones. And sudden, when it was gone a distance off, it did roll very swift over upon the back, first to the right, as that it would go that way, so that the humped men did leap off upon the other side. And immediately the creature rolled to that side, and there ran clear of the brute only four of the humped men, so that I knew that three were slain. And afterwards they that lived ran beyond the beast and got up into a second tree and the one that was chased did entice the creature to follow, and so did tease it once more to pass beneath the other men, and they very swiftly again to the back of the creature. And so from my sight, striking with the great stones, and the beast bellowing very loud and piteous. And how many of the humped men there were to the beginning of that strange hunting I know not, but surely there were few that lived to the end. And surely there were such things as this in the beginning of the world, and again was it thus in the end. And I did ponder this a little while, as I did sit upon the great branch, and hearken unto the sound of the hunting, that was now gone a great way off, and was presently beyond my hearing. And afterward I gat me to the earth, and did look this way and that way, to see that no beast was an eye, neither any of the humped men and afterward I eat two of the tablets and drank some of the water. And when I had got this far to a readiness for my going, I minded me that I should try the compass again as I did intend. And surely the machine did point between the north and the south, upon the westward arc, even as Nani had told unto me. Yet, as it did seem, with somewhat more of a southward pointing than she had made me to think and because of this telling of the compass a great ease came upon my spirit, for surely was not this but a sure sign that I did go direct unto that hidden place of the world where the lesser refuge did abide. But yet was not come over close, so that the pull of the mighty earth-current of the great redoubt was something stronger than in the place where was the little pyramid. And all this did I think very swift to myself and had a glad uplifting of the heart, as you do perceive, so that I went forward upon my journey with a great stride, and did scarce fear any strange thing that all the country did hold in that moment. And I went all that day at a strong pace, and did be oft tempted to send the master word unto Nani, yet did keep from so foolish an acting, the which, mayhaps, had brought straightway upon me an evil power, and had given me to destruction when that I was near come to the succour of the maid. And it was this quick and constant fear of the evil forces of the nightland that did keep me ever from calling unto Nani, lest that they should discover me and follow after. And this I doubt not you to know by now so well as I. Now by the sixth hour I was come into a part of the country where there were an exceeding abundance of steam-fountains and springs and great upboilings of water in basins of rock, and the air did be full of the sounds and the roarings of the boilings and the spoutings, and of a hot mist and spray, so that truly I had scarce the power to see to my front, nor to any side. And here presently I made a pause, and did eat and drink, and afterward went forward again and I did keep the shore of the sea always to my right, and so did go proper to my way, yet with no great ease, for the sea also did steam very strong in that part, and because of this great fog of steam I was surely much laboured to make a great speed, lest, unseeing, I go headlong into a hole of the boiling water. And in the ninth hour 
I did go clear of the hot boilings, and was come again free of the mist and the steam, and might look with mine eyes to my going. And surely, as I did perceive, I was come to the end of the great sea that had been ever to my right. For it did go against the feet of great and monstrous mountains, that went upward for ever into the night, and did seem that they were the hither wall of that strange country of fire and water. And so was I stood there very much taken upon doubt, for how should I go farther? And after that I had been there a while in a bewilderment of doubt and of wit, I went to the left, along the feet of the mountains. And truly, this but of common sense, for how might I go any other way, save I go back again? And at the twelfth hour I eat two of the tablets, and drank some of the water, and went forward once more. And lo, at the fifteenth hour I was come to a place between the mountains, even an upward gorge, very dark and gloomy, and without light for a great way. And in verity I did not want to go up the gorge, in that it was so dreary a place, and narrow, and horrid, and drear-seeming, after the light and wideness of the country in which I did yet stand. And presently I did go past the mouth of the gorge, that I should learn whether there went another way out of that country. And this wise for a great hour or more along the feet of the mountains, and did presently come to a monstrous black river that was maybe a mile wide, and it to be very shallow and seeming as that the water scarce to cover the mud of the bottom, and here and there a great steam did come from it, and spurtings and moundings up of the mud in many places, and monstrous babblings and puffings up of strange smoke, as that a great heat went beneath it in this place and in that. And surely it went backward into the country for a mighty way, so far as my sight did go, and I did think it to be no river, but truly a further sea. And there was no way across, for there were no trees anigh to make me a raft, neither might I wade across, for it might be shallow here and deep there, and the mud be in all places. And moreover, I had been like to be caught in one of those upburstings of mud, even did I have a raft to go upon. And because of all these things I get me back again to the gorge, and presently I did go upward into the darkness. Now I went upward very steady, save that I did stumble oft and did go through six great hours. And truly it did seem that I went in an utter dark, because that I had been a while in so constant a light. And by that I had been six hours in the gorge, I was gone right away from the country of the seas, and did be as that I was back into some place that was like to the dreadness of the nightland. For there were in this place and in that place of the gorge red fire-holes, even as in the nightland. Yet not many until that I was come a great way up of the gorge. And there did be life of horrid things about the fires, as soon I did what, so that I made to keep off from them. Yet, as you shall perceive, I must come oft pretty near, because that the gorge was nowhere scarce an hundred good paces across, and did oft come very narrow, so that I did come oft a nigh to the fire-holes, whether that I did heed to or not. And all that time and ever did the gorge go very sharp upward so that it was a very weary thing to make great trial of speed, as you shall know. But yet I went so fast as I could do, for I was grown sudden very excited about the heart, and to feel as that I did surely draw a nigh to that strange and hid place of the world where was the lesser refuge. And when I had gone upward through six great hours, as I did say, I took caution for a place proper to slumber for I was surely very wearied. And I saw a place presently afar upward of the dark side of the gorge upon the right, where a ledge of the rock did show in the glaring from one of the fire-holes that made a gloomy light in that place. And I climbed unto this ledge, and did find it to be secure and awkward to come upon. And presently, after that I had eaten drunk, I did compose myself unto sleep, the which came very speedy upon me, whilst yet I did believe I thought only upon the sweetness of the maid. And truly it had been something over three and twenty hours since last I did sleep, so that I was greatly awearied. 
and in six hours I waked and did eat, and did climb downward again to the gorge, and so unto mine upward journey. Now, as you do perceive, when that I was come properly a great way up the gorge, and had come among the fire-holes, there was no more an utter darkness, for the dull red glare of the pits beat upward upon the black sides of the rock-mountains, that did make the sides of the gorge, so that oft I did see both sides very plain in the lower parts, yet of the height of the gorge who might know aught, for the black sides did go upward for ever into the everlasting night and because of the light from the fire-pits, I did see, time and oft about the fires, horrid monsters, both that were snakes and others like to scorpions, so great as my head, but no more than these for a long while. And afterward I perceived that surely other matters did move among the rocks of the gorge, so that I did keep the discos very ready in mine hand, yet had truly no use for it all that day. Now I eat and drank at the sixth and twelfth hours, and went onward at a very strong speed. And at the sixteenth hour I did seem as that I knew the ether to be stirred about me, and the beat of the masterword very faint upon mine inward ear. And immediately a wondrous great and lovely thrilling did wake all my being. For surely, I said, this was the spirit of my love calling unto me with her brain elements and indeed this was a very proper and sensible thinking, for had the master word been sent from the mighty pyramid, I had been like to hear it very plain, by reason of the force of the earth-current which was with them and to their command. But as you do know, the earth-current was nigh gone from the peoples of the lesser refuge, so that they were over-weak to make any proper calling. And this I have spoken of before this place. Yet in a little while, as I did stand very hushed, that I should hark the better, I was come to doubt whether that I did truly hear the master-word. And one moment I did say that it had surely beat in the night about me, and immediately would I be just so unsure, and so in a while I got once more to my journey, and had doubt in my heart, yet, as you shall conceive, more of hope and because of this thing I went onward for thirty great hours from the time that I did wake, for my heart was excited within me. And when that I had gone so long forward as this, I did see how that I did foolishly, and I looked about for a place for my slumber, and I found a small cave that was clean and empty, and as I did discover by the shining of the discos which I made to spin a little time. And the cave was in the cliff of the mountain that made the right side of the gorge, and was nigh twenty good feet from the bottom of the gorge, and hard to approach. And when I was come secure into the cave, and sure that it was proper to my purpose, I eat four of the tablets, as was just and nice to my belly, and did afterward drink some of the water, and so to my slumber. And all the while very sweet and strong in my thoughts upon Nani, so that surely I was a little time before that I had myself rightly unto sleep and I slept six hours and did wake, for I had set my spirit hard into such wakening, yet was I still greatly yearning for sleep. But this did go somewhat, when that I had fought a little with my need. And afterward I eat two of the tablets, and drank some of the water, and did get my gear upon me, and was presently down into the gorge, and so again to my journey. Now in all that day I did go with a very stern speed, for it did seem as that my soul did know for surety that I was truly come something nigh unto that hid place in the night where I should find mine olden love again. And the sweet hope that was bred of the calling that had seemed truly to sound about my spirit was in all my being and more sure on that day than before that I had slept. And I went thirty hours in all, even as before, ere that I did come again to sleep and I eat and drank at every sixth hour, so that my strength should abide within me. And by that I was come to the ending of the thirty hours, I was sorely awearied, and got me upward of the monstrous cliff that did make the left side of the gorge, having perceived in a place a great ledge of the rock that did seem very proper for my purpose of slumber. And when I was come upward upon the ledge of the rock, I saw that there did seem something like to a mighty spider, that did stay half without of a hole in the back part of the ledge. 
and I smote the thing gently with the discos, so that it was very quickly dead. And afterward I searched well about, but did gladly perceive that there abode there no other horrid creature. And I eat two of the tablets, and drank some of the water, and did afterward make me ready for slumber as ever. But now I did put the cloak well about me, for truly there was grown a chill into the air of the gorge. And here also will I tell how that it did seem unto me that the air was gone something from that great thickness and strength which had been with me in the past days of my journeying. Now I was gone so tired that I fell upon sleep in a moment, yet with a dear thought and anxious concerning Nani, but was so starved of the body for slumber that even mine anxiousness kept me not awake. And I was then so fast with sleep that I knew not for eight hours a very sound slumber, and then did I awake and very thankful of the heart that no evil beast or creeping thing had come upon me whilst that I was so utter lost in sleep. End of chapter 9 Part 2